Lawson, good to see you, my friend. Hey, hi. How are you doing? Yeah, good. So listen, I want to catch up with you. You had an unbelievably good call last year. I mean, I think carbon was one of the best performing commodities in the world. It was the best. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I spoke to you on Real Vision, Pierre Andorand on Real Vision and a few others about this a while ago. And we've gone a long way, come into a new year. So I just thought it'd be a great opportunity to get your thoughts. Where, where we are now, what lies ahead and a bunch of other questions I've got. But first, if, actually, before Lawson, just give people who didn't see the first one a bit of your background so they know why I'm talking to you, what you do, that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I've covered the, the European carbon market since before it started. It started in 2005. I began to look at it in 2004. Um, I had a sort of a claim to fame, I guess, back in 2006 in January when I claimed uh, or forecast that the price was four to zero. It was trading at 30 at the time. And 11 months later, it literally went to zero. Uh, so I'll never have a better call in my life. Um, then I got. By the way, have you seen? Just sorry to interrupt. Have you seen the film about this? About the French carbon traders? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's outrageous. <laughs> it's, I, I had to stop watching it because the main character really annoyed me. He was just like incessant talking. I thought, oh no, I've had enough of him. <laughs> and, he, and he wasn't particularly blessed with intelligence either. But anyway, um, yeah. So so then I, you know, for, for many years after, I got really really dull. And then November 17, I twigged that they finally, they being the EU, had finally come up with this new uh, mechanism by which they're going to tighten the market uh, and realised that it was absolutely huge. So then in November, sorry, in January 2018, I published when it was at eight. Uh, it's now at 80 or just above. Uh, so it's been a 10 bagger. Uh, but uh, so the big question for me is whether uh, just for the fact that it's a 10 bagger, is that the end of it? And I think uh, the answer is no. Uh, it's got much more to come. Uh, so that's my carbon bit. Uh, and I've been a, a utilities analyst, would you believe, for 35 years because somebody has to be. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, I mean, this is perfect for you because this is where carbon meets utilities and it's kind of exactly your sweet spot. So talk us about what drove last year a little bit, just so people can get in the frame of what's going on here. Do you know, there's there's always a lot of noise flying around. Uh, uh, ultimately, for me, it's simple. Supply is too low versus demand, uh, and that creates the shortage. Uh, and we're, we are now in a multi-year, actually a decade of, of deficits. Uh, and that's what really, really matters. Then you've got all sorts of noise around that about, oh, the gas price has gone up and therefore the carbon abatement price versus coal is, is so much higher, so therefore carbon needs to be higher. But it, I, I think that's just a mirage and, and you know, really there's no sensible connection now with the gas price. And actually, if there were, carbon would be at 350 euros or something at the moment, given where gas and coal prices are. Uh, there's then there's political noise emanating from Poland and Czech and Greece and and so on, uh, saying oh the carbon price is too high. I mean I, I literally had a, a, a fight, as it turned out, with the Greek prime minister, uh, and now I'm having go at the Polish prime minister <laughs> because they've both said you know, energy prices are way too high, which is true, um, uh, and it's because of carbon, which is absolute rubbish, and it's because of speculators, which is even more rubbish. Yeah, I mean, I did I did do some calculations yesterday and I worked out that, you know, if you look at German power prices, uh, which are up fourfold last year, uh, from 50 to 200 euros per megawatt hour, 12% um, of that, just 12% is due to carbon. 80% is due to gas. And then there's a remaining 8%, which is probably due to uh, sort of a wider margins. Um, so, so bottom line is that it's all it's all down to gas. You know, carbon's done diddly squat, really. Twelve percent is no great shakes, particularly when you then take it onto the final consumer level, which means it's much more diluted, maybe a two three percent impact. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of moving parts, a lot of noise. Uh, of course, you have the Fit Fifty Five package uh, with the EU saying we want to tighten our twenty thirty goals. Uh, by having a 55% reduction in emissions from 1990 levels um, versus 40% target before. 
Interestingly, they put most of the brunt or bigger part of the brunt on, on the EU ETS system. So the EU ETS system, the carbon system, uh, has, uh, has the requirement to tighten its levels by 61% not the 55 the EU wants. The 55 is an average, and therefore, obviously, for the non-industries which are outside the EU ETS scheme, which essentially are agriculture, transport, and buildings, uh, they don't have to reduce their emissions as much uh, as the EU ETS. That's all really interesting, uh, but ultimately, that is an event which really comes in from 2024 onwards, uh, in my numbers anyway. Um, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that for the next three years, four years, we have a cumulative 100% shortfall in supply. So talk people through a little bit about what these, um, what the EU ETS system is quickly, just so they're on the same page, and why there's a supply-demand issue, a structural, massive supply-and-demand issue. Yeah, I mean, the the... So basically what it is, if you think of a bucket, right, you've got a bucket of permits of allowances, and these each allowance is, 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 allows you to pollute, right? so you can emit one tonne of carbon dioxide. Um, the entities which are underneath this umbrella of the EU ETS, the EU Emission Trading Scheme, uh, have to comply, and therefore they need to deliver the same amount of allowances as they have emitted on the 30th of April each year. So that is their sort of you know, groundhog day when everything has to be reconciled. So what it kind of means is that if you take a permit or an allowance out of that bucket, you're reducing the size of the bucket for those entities, which is going to force them to reduce their emissions. This bucket shrinks every year anyway, because that's what the EU is trying to do. They're trying to you know, go from here down to the 55% reduction, or in the case of the CEU ETS scheme, 61% by 2030. So that bucket shrinks, 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 which puts pressure on these companies uh, to essentially reduce their emissions, because otherwise they're going to have to pay a huge penalty price. And this is the thing, is that on, on the 30th of April, when you go to your government and you go cap in hand and you report your audited emissions, uh, you either have to deliver the same amount of permits or allowances. So if you produce 10 million, you, 10 million tons of carbon, you've got to deliver 10 million uh, carbon permits or allowances. If you're short, if you've only got six, because that's all you managed to buy, then on that other four, you will have to uh, pay a penalty price. And the penalty price this year is now 111 euros per permit. Okay. So, and it's actually worse than that because... Uh, maybe maybe I'll just show this chart. Uh, so so what this is telling you um, is that for for uh, 2021, right? You are 24% uh, short. That's the squeeze in the in the system, and therefore that means is that when you go to the 30th of April, you find that you are 24% short of what you need, i.e., right? what the permits you need to deliver to your government. And consequently, you have two issues. First of all, you say, well, hang on a minute, I'm going to have to pay a penalty price now of 111 euros per allowance that I don't deliver. Now, on top of that, so, so the first thing you do is you try and buy the permits. The permits go up because there isn't enough supply and it goes up to 111. When it gets to this 111 point, then you have a dawning realization that not only you're having to buy the permit for delivery, as a, or, or sorry, not only you're having to pay, pay a penalty price, but also you are now having to buy those allowances because you've got to deliver them next year, right? So you have two options. You can either deliver the allowances you need this year or you can deliver them next year with a penalty price of 111 on top. So that means that now you realise that on the 30th of April, you don't have enough permits, so you've got to pay that penalty price of 111. On top of that, you've got to buy the permits for delivery the following year. Right, so you're never ever forgiven. So consequently, given that those permits are now trading at 111, your penalty price or your, your opportunity cost is 222. Right, so therefore knowing that in advance, you will try and buy the permits. There aren't enough to go around. You've still got this 24% squeeze, of course. You drive them up to 222. And when you get to 222, you think, oh, bloody hell, I still haven't bought the bloody things. I've got a penalty price of 111. They're trading at 222. So actually, my opportunity cost is not, as I first thought, 111. It's not 222. It's actually 333. And that just goes on and on and on to infinity. 
Now, you say, well, actually, yeah, if, if you had a surplus the following year, that wouldn't be a problem because you say, well, sort of, I'll buy them next year, I'll be fine. But the problem is that next year is even worse. So next year you have a a 35% shortage, right? I this year in 2022. Um, and on top of that, you're trying to buy the 24%, which didn't deliver last year. So actually your cumulative deficit is 59% this year. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. You know, breaking through 100% shortfall cumulative in 2024. And that's before the Green Deal kicks in. Right, the Green Deal really is all you know. As, as I put down here, is 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 you know kicks in from twenty twenty four. So so really, it really has little impact, if anything at all, on the next three four years. And what may happen is that actually, this uh, the the Green Deal may kick in in twenty twenty three, not twenty twenty four, as I've assumed. In which case, this twenty six percent in twenty twenty three might be more like thirty five percent deficit. So it could get worse. And currently, the EU have not actually reduced carbon as much as they need to, right? Is that right? Well, no, absolutely not. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, you know, what, what, you, what you've had really, uh, in the first instance, we've had the switch from coal to gas-fired electricity. Coal produces twice as much carbon as gas. Uh, so we've had that. And that's about as much as uh, utilities can do today, power, which is half of the emissions of the EU, at least within this scheme, uh, has done what it can do so far with annual uh, reductions in emissions due to sort of renewables coming on stream and that sort of thing. So that, that will happen over time, but it'll be slow and gradual. We have had a setback with that power because, of course, Europe has run out of gas. Right, so we literally gas prices have gone through the roof, hence the 80% I was talking about earlier. Uh, they've gone through the roof because yeah, we had a pr prolonged outage or winter, I should say, last year. So storage levels uh, were not replenished as much as they should have been. Uh, yeah, the way the, the way the gas market was, works is that in the summer, at least in Europe, you push gas into the storage levels underneath uh, underground and then utilize that in the winter. The problem is that the that reserve wasn't injected high enough because it started late and then on top of that you've had problems with delivery of gas from from russia uh, and you've had lng problems with asia sucking up uh, lng prepared to pay more than europe and so on so you've ended up with a, with a bit of a mess uh, so the the consequence of that is that there actually has been a physical shortage of gas and therefore what was a coal to gas electricity switch over the last two years, which is exactly what I forecast back in 2018, has actually retrenched a bit. But that, to me, is a temporary issue, right? But the point is that power have done as much as they can if you normalise that, that issue. So now it's down to industry. And industry have done diddly squat since 2005. Why? Because they've been getting 90% free allowances ever since this thing started, Yes, they've tightened up a little bit this year and they've reduced that to 85%. But, you know, the carbon price was low in the past. They had only had to buy 10% of what they needed. Now they need to buy 15 so it's, it's more and the carbon price is higher. But it's still not anywhere near high enough where it needs to be to get industry to do something. And industry is not going to do anything until that carbon price is at that level and they see it to stay at that level. And then they'll think, OK, now we'll do something. But it's going to take them three, four years to reinvent the engineering processes and, and cut their carbon emissions by 30, 40, 50 percent, whatever they need to do. And what, what are the industries we're talking about here that, 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 that are going to be the who are the big polluters and need to change? Well, you've got power talked about you've got chemicals you've got oil and gas you've got metals and mining uh you've got ceramics you've got pulp and paper uh and there's probably one other fidgety widgety one <laughs> so so those guys have been kind of observing the market not really concerned about it but they're going to have to become players at what price do you think they have to they will start getting forced in where this where the 15 percent is actually meaningful to them I'll just rephrase, I think, something you said. Or, or, or I don't think most of them actually been watching it because it's just been way below the CFO's parapet, right? It's just right. non-existent. 
uh, and it's only now that the price is going up and that they're having to buy 15 instead of 10, and that it may, in some cases, raise its nose above the parapet, but probably still not enough. Uh, but that's, that, yeah, for some, some companies it is, and others it's not there yet. Uh, so, it is, so it is improving. You know, the, the way I think about this is, is, you know, if we think about the price of carbon itself, there are three ways to think about it. So, so this is the, you know, the forecast. So, so as I said, you know, back in January 2018, it was at eight euros. Uh, that's when I turned to buyer. Uh, it hit my 65 target of Q3 last year, um, two days before it hit 66, something like that. Uh, and then it corrected, and then we're now roughly around 88 or 86 at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so I need to move on one quarter here. But anyway, so, so for me, what happens is, first of all, because you don't have a uh, any liquidity in the market because it's all tied up in hedging, uh, because you have this multi-year deficit, um, which means that demand and supply just simply do not intersect. Uh, then unchecked, as we discussed, the 111, 222, 333, and so on, carbon will go to infinity. What stops it going to infinity is that at some point we'll have demand elasticity. Uh, so, you know, if it's costing us 10,000 euros just to have this, this, this connection, let alone uh, the hardware, uh, then we probably wouldn't have it. Well, it probably would actually <laughs> call it 20. Um, but then before that, you're probably going to get a political reaction, right? So the question really is to understand what price is politically acceptable, what price is required by corporates uh, to, to actually change their behavior. Now, when I look at the corporates, the first thing I have is, yeah, you know, I've got BASF who said that they won't do anything below 140. So in other words, the carbon price has to be at or above, more to the point, 140 uh, to get them to trigger or think about triggering uh, their, uh, you know, changing their carbon emissions. Um, and it needs to be there, obviously, for a sustained level. Um, you've got Heidelberg Cement talking about 120. And you've got BP and Volvo at 100. You've got Swiss Reed Insurance Company talking about 200. Uh, and you're going to have these new sort of shipping uh, coming into the scheme in 2024, but they're already thinking about what to do, and they are talking about you know 100 up to 150. So wherever you're looking at in that, you know that that certainly suggesting prices need to be north of where we are. Um, but politically, what I think happens is that the price goes up to a level, which we'll call 110 at the moment, which is sufficient to trigger that uh, the intensity of the political debate, which is a debate we've had ever since, you know, 2005 when the scheme started, or even Kyoto back in 1997 when it was discussed. Um, we, we get to that intensity of that debate, and that, that intensity of debate, then that triggers the political process, which will be very slow. Uh, it's got to be that the European Commission recognises that they need to do something, they then will come up with a proposal, which in the case of the Green Deal took nine months. Um, uh, the proposal then gets put in front of the European Council. They need 70% of their members to agree it. Then Parliament, uh, it goes over to Parliament, they need 50% of their members. They want to pretend they're doing some work, so they'll change it a little bit and bat it back and forth, maximum three times. And then it needs to be agreed between Council, Parliament and Commission, either trilogue. And when the trilogue agrees, then they will try and find a plenary session to put it in front of, uh, which, of course, is already sort of, you know, uh, back, you know f full of, of chocker blocks, shall we call it. Uh, uh, and then it needs to be enacted, rolled out. You know, th this is a long period, right? Um, <clears throat> that's not me barking, it's the dog. Um, <clears throat> so... So when we think about what that price could be, um, you know, we've had the fact that France Timmermans, who's head of the EU climate uh, MP, number two to or right hand man to Ursula von der Leyen, uh, he has publicly stated that the carbon price needs to be way north of 50. And I'm pretty sure, uh, given the murmurings I've been hearing from MEPs beforehand, uh, that that means two to three times higher than, than 50, right? So 100 to 150. Um, you've got Germany, which is you know, the industrial heartland of Europe, who is now putting in 
a, a carbon floor uh, of 60 euros. So they will then effectively go in and buy allowances as and when the carbon price gets to that level, or should it. Um, uh, and this is you know, the one country which in theory stands most to lose, uh, given that it is this the industrial heartland. Uh, you've got the European Greens talking about 150. You've got the Bank of England talking about 150. You've got Norway talking about 200. But all these numbers are interesting because, you know, when I started talking about this back in January 2018, they thought I was barking mad when I was talking about 65 euros. Uh, and I got massive pushback. People saying, you know, no way, we wouldn't even get to 50. Well, you know, here we are kind of thing. Uh, and it, and it's, it's, it's like carbon gets to the new level and you take your time and you reset a bit of panic and everything else and then resets and everyone says, okay, this is okay. They're all right. Yeah, fine. Okay. Now we can think about the next level. Uh, so, so I think it goes up in, in sort of like ladder rungs, if you like. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. And by the way, just to add one last thing, which is this bit down here. So it's, you know, I, I did a cross sector piece back in March, uh, uh, last year. Um, and what we did was to ask the 900, well, the, the 150 analysts to cover 900 companies at Berenberg saying, right, you know, what happens to your earnings per share if carbon goes to 110? And what was astonishing was that of the 900 companies, less than 3%, 26 of them, had a significant impact from carbon going to 110. And even more so astonishing, if you, then, if you then said, so let me just, sorry, just one last thing. If you then, if we then said, okay, well, unleash the beast, what happens if you pass on that cost to consumers what price increase do you need the biggest increase was airlines who just needed eight chemicals needed five and cement needed two so clearly 110 is not going to do it i mean that's what i'm just looking at this and listening to you i'm just thinking that 110 number looks ridiculously low yeah i mean i can't see a world where the industry itself has not started buying this and it doesn't really matter to them the eu needs that to change I mean, it has to change. Yeah. And so we're kind of, it feels like the market is short the upside and the more it goes up, they have to buy, cover their positions because they, they're just waiting until it hits a level. So it feels like you're going to have to go and flush all that out at some point. I mean, that's the market dynamics generally of a restricted supply increasing demand because it's an inc the demand increases the more it goes up, right? Yeah, it does. And and, and I th it's kind of what I said back in Jan 18. I mean, amazing things seem to have panned out. But uh, I think there is more hoarding of permits, kind of what I expected. Uh, because as as the price goes up, you begin to do your homework. Well, first of all, you just panic a little bit. Think, well, why is it going up? Why is it going up? Well, I'm not selling. I'm not selling. Um, and then you do your homework and realize actually you should be hanging on and buying as many as possible as a corporate, right? Um, or anyone else for that matter, but certainly as a corporate. Um, so, so actually, yeah, the supply is 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 tightening. It's tightening because of the MSR mechanism, and the liquidity is tightening because people are realizing actually I need to hang on to this stuff. And and that's kind of what I've, everything I've showed is, shown you is is pre snowball, right? What I call the pre snowball effect. And the snowball effect is that there will be everybody will be buying more permits. It'll be utilities will be buying more permits because uh, you will have customers asking for longer dated contracts, so four years instead of two, say, uh, which means that they will then say, yes, of course, here you are, and then they'll go and immediately hedge their carbon position. I buy more of it plus their gas. Uh, you're going to have industrials waking up and smelling the coffee and realizing what they should be doing is exactly this. Uh, you're going to have uh, financial investors obviously playing that. Uh, and then you're going to have the the sort of the net zero elements, which is uh, that both industrials and financials, for that matter, uh, will be setting their net zero targets. And I've had 50 meetings on with corporates over the last three months or so. I'm actually bored, stupid, saying exactly the same thing. But it's but it's it. I can sum it up. I mean, I actually, I was speaking to somebody just now, and I've, I've got next uh, week after next when I come back from skiing, I've got uh, the executive committee of a huge company. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd never seen such a turnout of top management who want to go through this. But the, but the, they're all saying the same thing. Yeah, we're thinking about net zero targets. We haven't set them yet. We're trying to measure our scope one, scope two, scope three, but we haven't quite measured that yet. And we know that we can offset 
the residual balance once you reduce your emissions as much as you can uh, to the level where you can't reduce them anymore. That residual balance, we know we can use uh, voluntary carbon offsets. I said, well, do you know that you can use emission trading scheme like EU ETS? Oh, no, I didn't. I'm going to take through this. I think, oh, this is such a better vehicle than voluntary carbon offsets. Voluntary is, you know, people are making a lot of money at the moment because of the huge opaqueness of that market. But it's it's fundamentally flawed, in my view, because, you know, let's say you let's say you're going to I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I'm getting excited. No, this is important because a lot of people you and I say it on Twitter, everyone's like, well, what about all of these new to- crypto tokens or different offsets? And I'm like, why would you do that when we've got the perfect system here? But yeah. car- carry on, explain the difference and, and why it's not so good. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing. From let's, let's first of all distinguish the two. The EU ETS scheme doesn't give a monkey's about voluntary carbon offsets. Okay, they both have the word carbon, but it's got nothing to do with the EU ETS scheme, which is what we've been talking about and are talking about. So, so don't confuse the two, which many people do. The voluntary carbon market is 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 like, for example, the most obvious is. We're going to grow a forest, which is going to be great because it's going to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, and that's a voluntary carbon market or offset. So, so people think, yeah, that's great because I can invest in that as a corporate and then say, hey, look, you know, we're doing this. And we can offset against what we emit and therefore we're, we're green. Um, that's not true. If you think about planting a tree, you know, if it's anything like my garden, you plant it and squirrel comes along and nibbles the bark. Uh, or, or the dog's going to do something against it, whatever. Uh, so, so the <laughs> the chance of that tree looking beautiful when it grows up to maturity are low. Uh, but anyway, let's assume that it survives uh, pests, it survives fire, it survives hurricane. You know, so you get a full maturity of the tree, which, by the way, will take 15 years to mature. But let's assume that happens and that the forest, all the other trees go together and they have this forest which is out in the in the prospectus and it delivers that. So they think, okay, good so far. Eventually, these trees will die, fall over and decompose. So clearly, you have to have a replanting schedule to maintain the forest size, which is what happens. It's what the prospectus generally say. What they don't say is that actually what you need to do is not just replace the tree which has fallen over, but also capture the carbon which has been released into the atmosphere. So really, your forest needs to grow infinitesimally. So it is a crap system. It's not ESG compliance. It falls down on all sorts of metrics. It's not regulated, right? Whereas the carbon permit market, the EU ETS, is fully regulated, fully compliant. I mean, look, here's just one thing which is worth talking about. You've got the... IIGCC, which is a terrible acronym. You'd have thought 250 pension funds could have come up with something better. But anyway, the IIGCC is 250 pension funds worldwide, all linked to this you know, under the same banner. And they got assets under management of $33 trillion. Right. And these guys have said, we will not accept a voluntary carbon market permit as a way to achieve our net zero targets. But we will accept a regulated carbon permit market. So in other words, the EU ETS is accepted by 250 pension funds with $33 trillion under management, and the voluntary carbon market is not. So so anyway, so going back to what I was saying, in terms of net zero, you've got pension funds, you've got companies, and as they begin to set the net zero targets, we'll realize that what they can do uh, is to invest in EU ETS market, which is much better and will be recognised by investors than the the unregulated voluntary carbon market. And again, I'm listening to you. Now you've brought another source of demand into the equation. I'm just looking at that 110 number and think that looks ridiculous now. <laughs> what is the number in your head that it actually reaches? Because I can tell you know this this bullish story continues to pick up for the next few years. And it doesn't stop. And the more well known it gets, and the more you go around speaking to all of these companies, telling the utilities they need to hoard stuff, and it starts going through the levels that forces the big pollutant industries in, that all feels like that's a two or three year process. So 
if you're wrong, you're probably wrong to the upside, right? It's I know yeah. you've got a big gray area with an arrow suggesting that it's something different. What is that gray area in the arrow? What is what, what's in your head here? The 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 first thing is that I'm not just speaking to utilities. Okay, I've been speaking to all sorts of, including cork manufacturers and and game companies, and to a plethora of companies I've talked to, uh, which is really interesting because utilities I know them backwards and they know me and everything else. Um, although one of one of that executive committee I was talking about is actually a utility, like a uh, week after next. Uh, but it's funny. It's funny. You can tell I've had this before. I'm digressing, but I've I've spoken to some investors where I've gone in and I've talked carbon back in 2018. Went back in 2019. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, good idea. Talk me through that again, and I talked through it again. And about, uh, after about the fourth meeting, he says, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? What's the price? Well, it's gone up, you know, 70, 80 percent now. Actually, no, it's gone up five, six times by then." And so, oh well, that's just uh, that, that's too. The price is too. It's too. I'm too late. All right. So some people never ever invest. You know, and people look at this now and say, "Oh, it's a ten bagger from 2018. Do I really want to invest these levels?" Well, forget the history. Right. It's, it's where it's going. So, you know, where are we going to? Um, you know, I mean, first of all, why have I got 110? I've got 110 because, you know, I'm an analyst and I've got to sit in front of a fidelity of capital or whatever, and I've got to justify the price I'm doing. And if I say, well, it's just, you know, my gut feeling, I'll be showing the door. But if I say it's 110 or 111, which is the penalty price, then that holds water, right? But but no, this goes north. The The, the, the question is, is is a combination of of speed and quantum right so if it goes to 110 tomorrow morning the eu will have to react right well not but at least if it goes to 110 stays there shall we say that that, will, that puts more pressure but if it's going to you know 150 over the next six months or eight months then that's more more acceptable right um uh, how high could it go? I mean, I, I think it goes way into triple figures. You know, is it 200? Is it 170? Is it 300? I, I really don't know. I mean, I can make a, you know, I know fundamentally it goes way up there, but then it's difficult to gauge that political response at what level does it come in and what does it do? But and it why will would take the pension back. funds, why would BlackRock not say with that group of pension funds, that we're going to buy these credits because it will force ESG changes amongst the industry. I mean, are they going to have a fight with the EU over this? Because, I mean, they're highly motivated by this, right? Yeah. um, I never, I mean, you know, I can can think of all sorts of different angles you'll have depending on the person that whatever investment fund, whether it's BlackRock or another. Um, uh, You know, some will say, well, it's not in my mandate. I, I'm not allowed to buy anything by equities. I can't buy commodities, you know, gas, coal, let alone carbon. Um, so, so mandates will have to change, and that's generally a slow process. Um, but to me, it's, it's to me it's blindingly obvious. But it's down to what you're restricted to do and and how big your pilotas are. Yeah. <laughs> It's just because I look at the BASF and if they're like, well, you know, that's the biggest chemical co- chemical company in Europe. If they're like, nah, not interested, call me up when it gets to 140 or 150. Well, that tells me that the price is not high enough. Oh, it's, if, it's, if the EU really wants change, they have to go well through everybody's targets. Because what you're basically saying is, is you know, Lawson, give me a call when it gets to 140, but don't bother me before then. Right, okay, that's... That's saying that, that there is no pain at 140 either. It's like, well, I'm interested. So it tells you that it kind of has to go to 200 plus for for the EU to get their emissions goals. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there isn't pain, right? There isn't pain today. Uh, at, and we'll, we can come back to Poland and discuss that if you like. But there's no pain now. It's just but, basically a nice system for governments to get a bit of revenue. Yeah, the, the revenues are huge. I mean, they, you know, at today's price, you're getting 50 billion euros per annum compared to the UK Brexit, which is 40 billion for one off. And, yeah, you know, it's going to go up. And, and ironically, for Poland, is making a lot of noises. They are the biggest beneficiary. They're getting 9 billion euros per annum from this scheme. 
It's, it's crazy. But yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 the price is not high enough in absolute terms, and it's not high enough because they can pass it on. Uh, and and you know what what should happen here is that they should reduce these free allowances, right? I mean they're reducing a bit this year, five percent. That's nothing, right? These things need to come down. What's big stopping time. them doing? What's stopping them doing that? What's stopping them saying we're going to make a forty percent reduction in free allowances? Stop piggybacking. Uh, because um, they can't. They, they cannot do anything fast. Okay, uh, you you have this legislation called le legitimate expectation. Uh, and if you are uh, relying on some legislation in order to make uh, decisions, then you cannot change that legislation quickly because you can sue them under the legitimate expectations law. Um, so, A, they know that. Uh, and B, actually, you know, the, every single meeting I've had since 2004 with the EU, they've said, we want the market to set the price. And if they change the goalpost quickly, they'd kill the market. So they kill the market and they get sued. Uh, and uh, and industry will be in absolute uproar. I mean, for example, look, you know, think they're, they're talking about implementing this carbon border adjustment mechanism, right? CBAM for short. CBAM is basically saying, if you want to come and compete in Europe, you're welcome to under the usual restrictions, uh, but you also must be on the same carbon footing as the European companies are, like the domestic players. And therefore, we are going to charge you a notional carbon permit uh, based on your output and your carbon intensity and so on and so on. So that sort of levels the playing field. That's fine and very sensible. Um, and it's potentially coming in, in 2024. But then you can't say we've leveled the playing field, but we're still giving our lot free allowances. Right, because that's just protectionism. That's not that's not level playing field. So so therefore they are reducing or proposing to reduce the free allowances from 2026 by 10 percent per annum, which is bullshit. Because it means not until 2034, 35 will you have zero free allowances. Like yeah, what should you know, what should happen if if your sole goal and it's not your sole goal, but if it is your sole goal to save the planet by 2030 in terms of emission reductions, then you should eliminate free allowances and let carbon go to the moon. What stops it doing all that is politics and yeah, it needs a bit more softly. And, and yeah, sure, we've got jobs to protect and look after people and everything else, but you know, that's that's the the difficulty. So why do you have the drop-off in price back down to 65? Because doesn't feel like anything actually changes for a while. No, and I got I got to coming back down seventy five in twenty twenty three, uh, but again still with a grey shaded area above it. Right. I mean, I you know I, I I think that whole curve is going to be higher. Yeah, that's a, that's what's in my head is like yeah the curve is higher and it's probably longer. Well, I mean, I've done to twenty thirty and, and and yes, I think I mean the scheme no, is because you've got the drop off afterwards, right? So it feels yeah. like. There's an elevated plateau, probably, whether whether it's oh, 110 so the plateau, or 110. Yeah, the plateau could be longer, yeah. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I think the actual political process will be longer, but then the market will anticipate that. So it's, you know, where it, what exactly happens to the price on the back of that and when to start discounting it. Now, getting a bit into the market dynamics, a bit nearer term now. So April is the date that everyone needs to prove their their carbon. Yeah. How much do you think has been done? Is it done? Is the trade done for the time being? So we can consolidate that you've said it should go in this stair step level, or is there still quite a bit of panic buying that needs to be done? What's your sense sense in this? No, no, I think we're in the in, in the in the final furlong uh, for this year, um, which takes us through it takes us through to April thirtieth. Uh, you know, we, we've well seventh of January today. Uh, uh, that means that. Uh, most companies, if not all, have not yet had the audited results for 31st December 2021 and therefore do not know precisely what their emission levels are because those are all also audited. Uh, once they have that in their hands, they will 
you know, if they haven't done much, and a lot of them haven't, uh, will realise what they need to buy and go out and buy it. You know, the, you know, there there is an a, a squeeze going into into April the thirtieth. What companies ought to do is a steady buying throughout the year. Yeah, but, but they're, they're still not used to this, really. I guess no. And most most companies anyway don't do that anyway. And then, and, and even, so, even some utilities, some utilities are, are not allowed to hedge. Polish utilities aren't allowed to hedge legally, and therefore they buy as they pollute. And I'm looking at the price action the last couple of years. We tend to kind of peak in June, then sideways consolidate for, you know, a lot, and then in the end, towards the end of the year, we start getting this need to to buy more. Does that feel like it's the same kind of pattern? Probably repeats itself. So we squeeze April, whether it goes on a bit further or not. Who knows? Yeah, um, and yes and no. Um, and again, uh, we're not trading this for short-term price gains. I'm no, just no, trying I know to get that. I know the structure. No, no, sure. I, I, I'm, I'm a long-term thinker anyway, but um, um, although I've become a bit more short-term of late, um, no, I, I think I, I think that's right. Except that the step change in the auction level triggered by the MSR happens in September. Right. So you've got really, you know, you've Talk got me through what you mean by that. So, so, well, so April 30th, you've got the, the compliance, the MSR is the, the market stability reserve. Uh, and that's the mechanism by which under certain circumstances, which are in place at the moment, it triggers a reduction in the pre-scheduled auction level which will set back in 2008 all the way to 2030 i it will increase so, supply a little bit to no it reduces it reduces supply reduces the supply. dramatically um you know the this 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 the whole market the demand supply imbalance it's not a story about demand okay demand is moving plus or minus a little bit but nothing too exciting it's supply so <clears throat> you know when you got uh, you know, demand of around sort of uh, eight, nine hundred million or so. Uh, you're getting supply reductions of three to three hundred and fifty million per annum for the next four years. It is huge, right? That's just the automatic trigger, um, and that's that's what this market is about. And that step change happens in September, and it looks back kind of like a two-year average, give or take, uh, and and adjusts accordingly. Uh, so, so that so so really, you've got uh, the thirtieth of April compliance, and you've got September, which is your adjustment. But underneath all of that, you've just got this massive imbalance, uh, and and the price going up, which is forcing people to wake up and understand what's going on, and that just increases and 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 uh, you know makes people behave by logically by buying more permits. So the way people play this, and you know, we talked about this before, and you and I have been on Twitter talking about it just because everybody always asks, right? So there's the EU ETS futures that trade on ICE, very straightforward if you're able to do that. Then there's the KRBN that's in the US. That's not a perfect tool. Do you want to explain just what's why it's different? Yeah, I mean, the KRBN is, is yeah, exchange-traded future. Uh, it is essentially a... Uh, it, it, it buys carbon permits around the world, right? So if you think about what that means, you know, today you've got, uh, in terms of carbon schemes, you've got the EU ETS, you've got UK, you've got Switzerland, you've got New Zealand, and you've got California and Reggie on the East Coast. So select six, and, and China, but chi China is, is virtually zero in terms of volume. So you've got six different places to invest. And what KRBN does is to take, it, it's a global carbon portfolio. So in, in actual terms, it means it's, it's about, depending on when it is on the, on the day or week or whatever, it's about 60 70% exposed to the EU ETS scheme and has exposure to others. So it's not a pure play on the EU ETS, but it does have exposure to the other ones if you want that. And... Are those global, without spending all the time going through all the global ones? Are they in a similar? Is it, are they generally similar schemes with similar kind of limited supply dynamics? So, is there a global squeeze going on? The prices have gone up. Um, 
but I mean, the California is kind of interesting because it says, you know, we'll we'll start off at this level. I can't remember what the level was, but quite low, uh, and we will increase the price by six percent per annum. So quite attractive. Uh, so you know, you can imagine a nice yielding uh, bond or whatever. Um, but the price has gone up beyond that, discounting an awful lot of that, and it's kind of discounting that maybe one day they'll you know, become much more real about it. And because the, the price now is about, I don't know, where it was, $30, something like that. Uh, so it's clearly not delivering what the EU ETS is at, at 80. Uh, and of course, as we know, 80 is way too low. Um, so, but, but I'm not getting the sense that those markets are uh, going to explode uh, the way the EU ETS scheme is at the moment. So because they haven't, they haven't had the history of, yeah, you know, the why are we here today in in 2022 with the EU ETS scheme? We're here because from 2005, apart from one brief fart in the end of 2005, from there to 2018, 19, the carbon price did diddly squat, and therefore the EU EU the EU basically spent years trying to come up with the right formula to get this thing going once, and they've finally done that. So these other uh, countries or schemes or whatever haven't haven't had that yet. Yeah, to me, I mean, I it all clicked with me immediately when I first heard the story, and then looked. You're going to mention Bitcoin, aren't you? I know you are. I, it's just it's a deflationary <laughs> cryptocurrency with ongoing <laughs> demand. I mean, it's pretty bloody obvious to me how this works. And you know, yeah. I saw that, and it's like, okay, well, we know how this works out, and it's deflationary. So we're seeing. You know, even in cryptocurrency world where Ethereum is going to go to this deflationary asset um, where you're buying back or removing supply. I'm like, yeah. it's the same, as, same as this carbon market. The other um, instrument is that is GR, GRN, is it? What's Yeah, GRN is, is, is one that's quite a liquid. Um, right. Uh, then you've got IG Index. If you want to do spread betting, if you're not in the US, you can do that in the UK and so on, or, or the Europe, whatever. Um, so it's pretty limited at the moment. Yeah, at some point, we, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult for traditional retail investors, shall we call the man on the street, uh, to invest in carbon today. Uh, uh, you know, ETF is like, what? But at some point, a product will come out which allows retail to get involved. I mean, the, the KRBN is not the worst. No. You know, people look at it and go, well, there's a bunch of cash. It's because they invest in futures contracts just so everybody's aware, so they don't need to put all the cash in. But yeah. it's it's not a bad product. No, that's no, good. I mean, it's just delivered price price performance. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Lawson, listen, thank you, my friend. That's uh, just a good update to know where we are, what we've got to see. Sounds like an, the, the year ahead is going to be another interesting year, right? Yeah, it's super exciting. Yeah, yeah. Sorry you're having to put up with such bad weather, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Perfect. And we'll I'm sure we'll catch up with you again kind of halfway through the year to figure out where we are then. All right, cool. Good to see you. Take care. Bye. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.